ladies and gentlemen, we will be having our next panel discussion and the topic is explaining AI, bridging the gap between technical experts and non-technical stakeholders. And for this, we have our moderator. Please allow me to welcome Anuj Madan on stage, please. All of you, please give a big round of applause to Anuj Madan, the head strategy of Oman Arab Bank. Can we have uh, Mr. Anuj, please? Mr. Anuj is the moderator, then I would like to invite our panelists. Let's welcome Sanjeev Mishra, the founder and CEO of We Remember Technologies Private Limited. All of you please put your hands together. Audience, uh, yes. Then we have Gabe Carr, managing director of 10UP, Christine, founder and managing director of ACS Plus, Shuji Rakeja, the managing director of Shift 180 Business Advisory and Services. And lastly, I would like to present you Ahmed Sirak, the professor and director of AI Innovation Center, Will Cornell Medicine, Qatar. Yes, all of you please put your hands together for our moderator and panelists. And we will be having a really great panel discussion. And after that, we will be having the recognition and award ceremony. Thank you, Shekha. And thanks to the previous panelists. Great insights on the leadership, communication, and expectation, the skill set, the passion, and the non passion. Uh, so AI is becoming the next literacy of the world. We had education, we had financial literacy, we had social literacy, and AI is the next literacy term, right? So that everybody is talking about it. And we are into the third day of the conference. Um, you know, last two days we've heard several ideas about how AI has been successful. However, there is another side as well. Uh, the research suggests that there's only a fraction of AI solutions which actually yield to the business outcome. So while there's enough work which is going on on the AI, what is it that the business requires? And that brings me to the topic of today, which is how do we bridge that gap of the business non-technical stakeholders versus the technical experts who develop those solutions for us. So thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I have in my panel Gabe, who's the MD for Tenup, Sanjeev, who's the founder and CEO for uh, We Remember Technology, Christine, uh, she's come from Germany and she's the managing director for Ace Plus, which is the uh, founder for Shift 180, and Professor Ahmed Serag. He is an academician as well as the founder for Innovation Center at Great. So my first question to you, Sanjeev. You've transitioned from being a technology developer in banking into owning your own company, devising solutions. So how this transformative change has helped you learn about your customers? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for introduction. So yeah, I worked for almost 12 years in the bank and then three years back I formed my own company. Uh, so I have seen a lot of transition over there. When it was a bank, it was a matured company. It had the ecosystem where uh, we have customers who are more educated, and we have tech team, and there's a team who is lying between these two people, like project, project manager or business analyst, or people who are doing the data analysis and all. And then we have another system, which is called COE, right, center of excellence. So in case of any gap is there, COEs are there to bridge the gap. And uh, in case user is not happy or user is not very clear about the solution that we are implementing, then this team can come in the picture and people trust them. That's because you have done some POCs, you have done some pure uh, project, so they listen to that. When it comes to uh, and other things, there's a training as well. So a lot of mature teams over there in uh, big organization which are kind of 
having good ecosystem to be close there. When it comes to small uh, companies or mid-sized companies, I do consultancy to various tech companies. Ninety percent of my uh, clients are tech companies, and ten percent are uh, healthcare and energy domain where there is no uh, technology business. Both are different. When I suggest something to non-tech companies, they trust me. They listen to me, and it's very easy to educate them. Tell them what is AI and how we can provide some solution. My challenge is again, it may not be the case for everybody else, but my challenge is when I deal with people who are technical companies, small mid size. They have their own knowledge, they have their own um, uh, users, and they come and tell me the solution. My request to them is always tell me the problem, and then leave the solution to me. I can definitely implement something. I'll give an example recently where I work for a client, and then uh, they wanted to uh, tell me that implement unsupervised learning for a certain problem, right? And I said, I understand you have heard what about unsupervised and supervised, but what is beyond that? You don't know. Trust me, let me solve the problem, and I'll try to give a solution. And then say no, implement unsupervised because their definition of unsupervised is once it is done, it is done. Because unsupervised. Tomorrow, if I want to do something, I want to extend it. Will done automatically. So it's not the case. So I educated them how to, how to, what do they mean by unsupervised learning? And it is not that once project is over, it is all done. You have to keep on doing iteration, keep on doing the training and all. And that's where after two months, uh, when all this exercise done, and uh, they realized it is not going to solve the problem, then they said, "You are expert. Please solve the problem." Right. And that's where I got a trust, and we built the product in uh, almost uh, one and a half months next uh, two years. Great. So basically, instead of non-technical stakeholders, you'll be facing challenges with the technical experts that you're dealing with. Exactly, because there's a so pressure that everybody should know AI ML. So everybody will read something, and then they feel that they know. Christy, I want to turn to you on this. Uh, you know, uh, you've got decades of experience. Uh, you know consulting with these clients. So how has your tools, visualizations that you provide or you know the discussions being with your stakeholders uh, to manage such challenges? Yeah, first of all, I can just underline, often it's the hardest part to work with the techies because they exactly know what they need and um, how it's need to be implemented. So personally, I was challenge or first of all start with the question is AI a technical topic? I would say no. Either every stakeholder is on the table. Yeah. AI is technology and technology is in the majority of cases a means to the end and not the end. So if somebody agrees with this and is then willing to work with me um, then what, what I really try is to have all stakeholders at the table and really try to come up with what you said, what do you want to achieve, so a line on the target. For, don't tell me anything about the solution. I never, I'm not interested in the roadmap. What do you want to achieve? And second, and this is a step where, if possible, I use a little bit of humor, is figure out that on this table, and whether it's a huge company, so I work in banks, also now I'm concerned with a lot of startups, three people at the desk, where they use the same vocabulary and mean something completely different. And so just to give an example, my background is in statistics. If I come up and say, I develop a model, it's something that more is a task like research. Yeah, so I don't know the solution, so I feel like um, it's a huge endeavor. Will I come to the island I'm looking for, or maybe there is no island? Just then, because I'm lazy, I say, I'm currently in the phase of development. And then I meet a software developer who is completely, are you not using Scrum? What are you doing? She's mad, she's crazy. So um, either we figure out that we have a misunderstanding in such a simple term like development of this data data, variable, feature, you call it. So even the techies, we have different languages. So and here I try to create awareness, and if possible, that's with a nice result of the first session, first of all, we align on what you want to achieve for the company. Second, 
we figure out where's your responsibility, where's my responsibility, and I would not go so far to say we need a common language, but we need a lingua franca for the interface. I, if I have something ready, I shouldn't go to the developer and say, that's my pool model. What have I really proposed? This is the requirement that you need to implement afterwards to put it in production, stuff like this. And um, that's my receipt, at least from the first steps of such a project. Good. So what you are interested in and how you could solve. That comes to Gabe. He's worked in some of the fields, uh, which is marketing and campaigns, including political campaigns uh, and content publishing. There, it is more to do with unstructured data, unstructured analysis. How do you convince them? Yeah, I think it's always, uh, to, to the point that's been made a couple of times, it's about understanding what are you trying to accomplish, what's the actual problem, what are, what are the outcomes we're hoping to achieve. And so, you know, in, in the case of some of the work that I've done in the political space, it's you're trying to get votes, right? And so what are the, what's the information that we have at our, at our disposal and what are the tools that we have at our disposal to use that information to try to get people to vote for the candidate that we're campaigning for? That's one example. In the publishing space, it's usually a really simple problem you're trying to solve. There's kind of there's two things, or there's probably three things. You're trying to analyze your content so you can uh, provide better search results, so you can provide a little bit more metadata with it. You're trying to get people to the right content that they're actually interested in, so you're trying to understand patterns of behavior. Um, or you're trying to actually generate content in a more effective and efficient way. So you've got three different things you're trying to achieve, and there's different ways to approach each of those problems. Very rarely is AI actually the solution to that. Usually it's natural language processing or some version of machine learning or behavioral analysis. And so by breaking it down into that problem, we start to isolate, okay, what, what are the potential solutions here? And then we start to experiment, right? Because that's actually, what we always have to do when we're trying to solve the more complex problems for our clients is that experimentation. We have to bring them along that journey. We think this tool here is gonna help us get people to read 20% more content, but this tool is working on different clients with different types of content, with different types of users. It might not work over here. And so we try to bring our clients along that journey to, to help them experiment, but always with that understanding that it has to be founded in what does success actually look like for this experiment, right? If, if you start without understanding that, you're never gonna know if that experiment is successful. Great experiences. Bringing me to Shuchi. Shuchi, uh, what we hear from Christine, Gabe, Sanjeev, you know, they've been like long into consulting and you know, having a different set of challenges. You recently founded your company and you moved from a corporate world to advising clients. Now, what was that trigger and how are you experiencing it? Uh, yeah, so uh, to be an introduction about myself, so I spent around 17 years in corporate, uh, worked with top tier organizations, uh, KPMG, Accenture, TCS, and there have got opportunity to work with clients across the globe. And uh, last year, this time, I founded Shift 180, and Shift 180 currently has uh, two uh, line of business. One is the platform called Advisator, and that is exactly doing the function of bridging the gap between technical and non-technical business community. And then we have uh, management consulting services. So that was just a brief introduction, but I want to come back to the main uh, topic. Um, so during the 17 years of experience, uh, AI was perceived by clients in different manner. And that's where a lot of uh, advisory and consulting was required as we uh, want to execute or deploy the solutions which came in the form of workshops. Uh, even before that, I just want to talk more on what is AI. Uh, like explaining and clarify few things. So AI is artificial intelligence and intelligence with set of instructions being coded in the uh, technology and the technology does the job which a human is expected to do. That is the artificial intelligence. 
Now there is a set of algorithms in AI which is driven by data and those set of algorithms are called machine learning. So machine can learn from the data and uh, execute the task in an intelligent manner. So this is what AI is all about. At times client thinks AI is a gym. Some magic will happen. And what they expect is a model to be developed and deployed. So because of this high expectation, there was a lot of confusion at the point of, uh, at the point of uh, delivery. And uh, that is why I believe at this point in time, there needs to be a lot of awareness workshop that can uh, simplify the technical language of AI and help the non-technical uh, stakeholders understand the very uh, sense of AI, what it is capable of doing and what it is not. One more, one more thing I would want to highlight is here is that uh, there is a research element involved usually in the machine learning perspective as my friends here have already touched upon. There is always a research element because you don't know what data insight is going to come up with. We have to experiment, we have to uh, come up with an hypothesis, do an experiment and come up with a result. Hypothesis can be validated or not validated but time will be spent. So non-technical stakeholder needs to be informed that time will be spent but outcome might not be favorable. So setting these kind of expectations I think can help in bridging the gap between technical and non-technical stakeholders. Great. Professor Sarag, you have a different set of challenge. You deal with students and you deal with clients. So what is that advice basis, your client's experience that you give to young professionals and how do you manage the expectations of both with all the enthusiasm that they are? Well, that's a, that's a very inter interesting question because um, I think in general, the technology has been evolving so fast, right? Not only AI, and this is something that not only my students, but I have to tell to myself that we need to be continuously learning, right? Uh, as in the previous panel, like people have been talking about programming languages, they started like C++, but then now like everyone's almost using Python, right? The tools we have, I think almost now every every year or two we have like new tools, right? Especially in, in AI, right? So there is a need for that, not only to, to students, but even to ourselves, all of us. Um, the second advice is probably again the the point that the other panelists has mentioned already that if you're really deep enough in your technical work, you still be able to communicate with your stakeholders, right? I have been in both worlds, in industry and academia, right? And there is no silver bullet solution, especially in AI, right? So you need to speak to the stakeholders, either these are your collaborators in academia or your customers in industry, understand their needs and being able to translate these business needs into a technical solution that you can build. I think the third important point I would like to mention as well is that um, most of the time in, in AI, you will need more people that have creativity and problem solving skills, right? Not just like people who would be able to deal with it as a job, that you just give them a task to perform and that's it, right? Because I've been with um, students, as you mentioned, or researchers that will be able to come and say, oh, I ran this algorithm on the data, this is what I got. But this is not the end, right? They need to figure out if really their model converted on how did they validate it and they made sure that they have validated this in the right way. So it, it, it's, to be honest, like not something easy to teach, it's a journey, but I think these are the three most elements that probably if, if everyone that has been aware of, that will definitely help them for always to be ready for the future. Just to, just to jump in there, I, I think one of the things you're highlighting as well is that AI is an incredibly immature technology. Right? There are new things popping up every day, every week. There are changes happening to the things that exist. There's new versions coming out. And so within that, the, the idea that you can have just an answer to a problem is, is just incorrect. And so 
that idea that you constantly have to be learning and you have to understand the concepts more than you understand the technology right now because those concepts aren't changing at the same rate that the underlying platforms are. So that, that's why I think the most important thing is that invest in people, not in technology. Because if you invest in people, they will be ready to, to use any technology and build new stuff. But if you invest in technology, today's technology will be obsolete tomorrow. So we're getting to hear similar things from our previous panelists of leadership, managing expectations, having the right communication, and investing in people. I think somebody in the audience asked a uh, question about having the passionate employee, non-passionate employee. So it's getting interesting. So even though we have AI, we're still talking about people. Great. So what are the common misconceptions, Sanjeev, that you face with clients, right? And how do you address that? Okay, so one common misconception is that I want to implement AI based on use case. Rather than the reverse way, where I have use case, I want to implement solution. And people feel like there's end of the project, so I'll give you three months and then you finish the project, where they don't understand that this is not going to be three months. It may be like somebody mentioned that we have to do experiment that can be successful, that cannot be successful, we don't know at this moment. And the first requirement is to understand your data. Majority of people feel like, um, in my experience, I, I'm not too sure about others. People have very less data, they want to implement AI. Right? So if I talk about machine learning thing, and if you give me 100 documents and say I want to do some classification problem, how can I do that thing? Right? Other, the, the other thing is, it may be due to uh, the IP thing or maybe due to the, some uh, privacy. They don't want to share huge volume of data. That's another challenge, right? And that's where <coughs> few clients, they're not that much open to give you enough data. And that's where I struggle to convince them that, okay, fine, I'll give you a code, I'll give you a model, you can train yourself, that's fine. But we need data, that is one requirement. Second misconception is like, I'll give you any data, right? I need good quality data. If I train a model giving a cat image, saying it is dog, and then tomorrow you send a real cat image and then it is giving dog, it is not wrong, right? So misconception is human can be wrong, machine cannot be wrong, right? AI ML is not a magic. Whatever you train, the moment means we see something, we learn similarly, whatever you train the model, that will give the same answer. It is not the case that machine will be always right, right? Another thing is, we think that whatever solution machine is going to generate will work for me, right? It may not be the case. Another uh, thing what I see is the AI project or machine learning project has end timeline. It may not. It may be iterative. It may work to today. It may not work to tomorrow because the, mo the moment you have more data, you need to retrain them. Who is going to retrain them, right? If you're hiring a consultant tomorrow, you need to train somebody within the company to train the model, right? Another thing is, I can run machine learning on my laptop. Those projects I can run on laptop, it's not possible. If you want to have, let's say, one million data to process, you take four days, how can you get something done in three months? Because the moment is more experimental thing. You try something, it fails. You try another algorithm, it fails. You try another fine tuning, it fails. You try another parameter, it fails. And every time you take three days, then you understand one month is gone, you have not done anything, and then the question is, I paid you something, it's been one month, what is the progress, right? So these are few misconceptions from my side, which I experienced uh, in last uh, three years, and I want to share with you. Great, so quite iterative, right? So Shichi, how about you? Are there any misconceptions that you face? Yeah, I think one misconception I would want to bring out is the fact that AI is not a Python or any technology tool. So clients believe that hiring one data scientist is enough. Uh, this is one big misconception. In reality, AI is a synergy of many fields. Uh, these fields are business knowledge, statistics, technology, data knowledge. All these experts, when they come together, then they build a robust solution in AI. So one data scientist is not going to get the result uh, desired. This is one misconception. And another thing I want to highlight, second thing is, it should solve a purpose. AI should solve a purpose. The hypothesis has to be very clearly defined. 
and the team should experiment to validate the hypothesis from the data and then proceed and not like jump to building the algorithm before testing the uh, the the validity of data that can provide insights for the hypothesis thank you Christy, can you provide some examples from your experience, you know, which are very specific that how were the successful strategies implemented post discussion with your client and they got convinced from their erstwhile thought process? Yeah, actually, I would like to link to the, the keynote this morning. For me, it's about storytelling that helped a lot. So um, I call it the data kitchen and say data processing is like food processing. So at that moment, also management listens, IT listens, everybody listens. And then the purpose, are you a school kitchen? Do you want to be a Michelin restaurant? Do we have 20 tables or only five? So that's a little bit about scaling and immediately stops the guy who want to wait and buy the next data lake. The second or the, the other part that comes clearly to mind is in production, on a Friday night, serving all your customers, your chef won't develop the next receipt. This is a task for Tuesday morning, maybe even in another room and not in your normal kitchen in the restaurant. And this is what we are doing as data scientists, or you call it AI architects, whatever the name. We are not working in the production environment. We have a special room, and maybe a lot of you will agree, 80% of the time we are mingling the data. So, and then using this kind of storytelling, this language, if I'm then asking the manager, what do you think in production? Is there a quality control at the gates when the data enters? Is the light on when you produce? And do you have a final check on the food that you deliver, the data product? And actually, with this story, a lot of things afterwards get easily solved because there is then a common understanding, and it's exactly what you said. Hiring a data scientist, this person might be even frustrated to put them in a room, there are no data, nobody can explain something. If you have a system approach, and I call it data-driven system, then a lot of things can be done easily or easier. Yeah, just one point I want to just want to elaborate on this last point. Uh, making people who will be working behind the scene a data scientist, exposing them on the operations is a very important task and activity which needs to be carried out because the person who is coding should know what is he is going to make an impact on. So I think this bit is also uh, which is missed out when setting up teams for uh, accomplishing AI projects. Just staying on this Shoji because I think when you started off this like two years back it was like the right cusp of people moving to open AI. Right? right. So the very first client meeting that you would have had, what was that success factor for you? Uh, just want to understand a bit more on the question, the success factor in As in like, when you met the, first, the client and they're talking about AI, so how did you, what was your strategy to make that successful as a client, you know, listening to your idea and implementing? Okay, so I think we had to uh, talk a language of their language, we have to start from their story and help them understand through workshops that what is the uh, level of impact AI can bring to this project. Great. So doing a workshop, actually taking that extra one hour out and elaborating on the concepts of AI is helpful. Education. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Gabe, so to, over to you. Uh, you talked about and with the kind of clientele that you have, how transparency and trustworthiness how important are those factors in your meetings? I think it's pretty central to, to any of these types of projects, right? Whether, whether it's AI, ML, any other technology that, that is kind of more on the experimental side, you, you have to start from a shared understanding of what's the journey we're gonna go on together. And so where I find this to be most 
effective and, and easiest to break down is when you can break down the problem to a really small problem, right? So let's take a publisher, for example, where we can start with the understanding of, okay, we just want to solve a problem of what does the reader do after they finish the article? The next best action, right? And ideal scenario is we get them to read another article, but the reality is we're not going to get that with everybody. So we may just want to serve them an ad. We may want to get their email address. We may want to do five different other things. Right, so we can break that problem down and then we can start that experimentation process. And when you break the experiment down to a small specific area, you start from a place of trust and understanding. And you start with that kind of journey together. And I think there's no way to do this with a client and I, I wouldn't even go down this route with a client if they don't wanna go on a journey with you because otherwise their expectations are gonna be mis mismatched from the reality. And Sanjeev, you mentioned earlier that you know you went to a client and client said that I want unsupervised, you are definitely supervised. So how is your experience in the space of transparency and trustworthiness of the subject? Yeah, so I always like to be honest. Uh, so if in case client has any question, and uh, I was talking about that thing before, uh, if I think something is not going to work, I don't take time, I tell that it is not going to work. They like it, they don't like it, it's their choice. But my job is to ensure that whatever I recommend, I am right on my recommendation and uh, we can build a trust. And because ultimately when they don't work with me, they will work with somebody else, they'll realize that error, but they will come back to me, right? So I always try to be honest and then uh, I educate them, I make them aware. Uh, in, if needed, then I can give, you some, give them some YouTube channel as well to understand how to evaluate their problem and they themselves can be empowered enough to see the solution or evaluate the solution. Great. Professor Sarah, do you, how important and how do you manage the business goals and relate to those problems and guide your young folks or your clients, right, on how important they are? And how do they even relate to them being from a technical background? Because that's an essential key of managing that communication piece between non-technical. Well, that that's a very good question. It's probably very complicated as well, right? Because um, I I worked even like uh, almost for seventeen plus years now with AI in industrial marketing, and where even my stakeholders have been doing even within the same uh, domain like uh, healthcare. Has been very different. I could have dealt with radiologists, pathologists, and, and all of these have different uh, requirements, right? And different needs, different problems to solve, basically. Um, and also relating to the other point when uh, the other panelists mentioned, like a customer is coming to you and say, for example, I want unsupervised or supervised. Uh, personally, I don't do that. So when I start to collaborate with, with um, a customer, I said, I want you to explain to me very well what is your problem in non technical terms. But I, I don't have to let them know how to solve it. Otherwise, they, they should have came to me, right? And, and this is true, either in academia or industry. This is the same way I do for all of it, right? Because I think we need to be aware that um, a domain expert will never be an AI expert or a technical expert and the other way around. And that's why probably there's this need for the collaboration. Now, once they explain briefly and at some point and other places in more detail what are the requirements, we translate this into a technical problem right and this is where we have different teams to deal with that and and there's always trade-offs right because sometimes you want to build a solution that is very accurate but then if they said it has to to be um very accurate but also run under specific time limits right so you need to have this trade-off right which maybe if you want it to be a little bit faster solution but of course it will be a little bit this, right? So all of these also need to engage lots of teams, not only AI experts, but how we communicate either with other technical teams like engineers, for example, right, who deploy this, right? So you need to work with these teams as well. And again, the researchers who build these technologies are not probably um, very good engineers, and they don't have to be, right? Because I, th I think this is where it becomes very interesting, right? So you have the domain expert, the one who has a problem, and then the AI researchers will build these, and then you have the engineering team who will take all of this and deploy it, right? And the end will cycle back to the domain expert or the stakeholder who had the problem initially. So it's very, it's very interesting how it works. It, it works 
as I said, with, with different uh, customers, with different collaborators, it's gonna be slightly different. But probably this is the, the main the main cycle that we'll get through. And as I mentioned earlier, everyone needs to be aware of their expertise and also their limitations in this communication. And I think for clients, it's an incredibly convoluted process, right? People are used to coming to an agency like us and having us solve an engineering problem, but it's not, to your point, an engineering problem. But then once you get to huge sets of data, that becomes an engineering problem, right? So how you can communicate to the client the different pieces of that problem, the different challenges we're going to face, the different people involved in solving that is really, really complicated and, and it's not the same for every single situation either. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, have you ever proposed uh, doing proper assessment of organization before you start the engagement? Because many times I believe client themselves don't have uh, that readiness for AI projects because there is not enough data or for some other reason. So have you ever uh, We suggested? always do that. We always yeah. do that because as you said, sometimes even like, especially now, like some people come to you and say like, oh, you, you work in AI, I want to build an AI solution. And then they say, but my data is like a few hundred of samples, right? Which is definitely not really an AI problem, right? You could build small, small models, statistically based, that could help them getting something out of their data. But we all know that most of the AI we talk about these days is this computationally demanding deep learning based neural network based algorithms, right? So we, we get this all the time. And I think from the first discussion, I could be straight to the person and say like, no, this, this is not really an AI that you need, right? Yeah, in, in my company, we call it data readiness assessment. Yeah. So it's number one and then before. I, I come to you, Christine, in a minute, but before that, Professor Sir, Christine touched upon a topic of storytelling. Um, so how do you think in your case, and my again, because you deal with both set of you know stakeholders, how, what are those interactive demos and visualizations, and why touch upon visualization and interactive demos? Because people believe what they see, right? Because they hear a lot, as Sanjeev or you mentioned that, you know, they heard about AI and everybody's talking about it, but they believe in what they see first because that's the real impact. What, how are you using those tools on interactive demos or visualizations to ensure your client is on board? So storytelling um, is a very important skill now of, of AI and data science. Unfortunately, we're like this a bit late, right? So we start to talk about data storytelling probably, I would say five years ago or probably less. Um, it's something, again, I had to educate myself more because most of the time I, I don't speak only to technical people at conferences. I get invited to talk to other people that are not necessarily coming from a technical background, right? Um, it's very important skills. Now we have this for all the people who work with, I mean, the technical teams we have. They need to be able to go to the deep details, but to be able to simplify this and explain it to people who are non-technical. Um, I also absolutely agree with you on the second point about visualizing. I'm a visual person myself, and I tend always, and I believe that, as people say, one picture would work a thousand words. So most of the time, when we even work on how we present our work, either in a scientific publication or in a presentation, right, it's always good to sometimes summarize a context you have with, with something visual, than basically like having a slide with like, 50 words, for example, right, or more. So I, I think these are very important skills, not only in AI, to be honest, but probably for the technical domain itself. And I think I started to see awareness of that a few years ago, and I believe it's increasing. Absolutely very important. Christine, what's further? Yeah, Abbott, even go so far that the storytelling is my, in a way, superpower, because I'm, I have this technical background, but I have been, um, Vice people, officer of the bank, so you needed to have the different perspectives. And maybe for me, number one, as I already said, it, this data kitchen. So data processing is like food processing. And if you have created this level of trust to come to this visualization, if your customer client is open, you might have a look, be allowed to have a look at the data. And there is always something comparable to number of kids minus four. 
and to just show them the number of kids minus four. So watch, how can this be? What had happened here? And often with this kind of examples, if they can really grasp it, they see it in their own data, the result doesn't make any sense, neither technically nor semantically, then normally you can really work and you often come to the, yeah, the, the root cause. So data quality is also some, like food quality, I check it before I prepare food for my daughter, I of course check the ingredients. Technically, we might omit this boresome stuff, it's, it's so important and in the technical realm, it's not often clear what quality means. It might be timeliness, yeah? A forecast with the data six weeks before, um, a few days prior to election, doesn't help anybody. So this is something, uh, with this storytelling, have a look on your client, what is their story? And then try to transform your concept in their world as good as it possible. And for me, that's really one of the major drivers for success. Great. So two things that at least I've learned. One, uh, you know, Sanjeev mentioned that human intelligence cannot be replaced by artificial intelligence. And to your point, just extending that, like just a few days back, I was having a conversation at my home with my wife and she mentioned, see, whatever happens, common sense cannot be replaced by AI as well. Right. So we are into the last 10, 11 minutes and we just have a quick rapid fire. I'll begin with you, uh, Sanjeev, in one word, can you describe generative AI? The future. Great. What excites you most about generative AI? <laughs> the thing is, means now it is a power to everybody who is technical, non-technical to do something which we were not able to do in the past. I'll give one example where <coughs> 10 years back somebody goes to a person saying, I want a website. They say, put the button on the left hand side and then he goes to the so I mean top left, right? So the thing is now you have a tool where you can generate thousands of different websites, you do your research, spend 10 days, 5 days and then go to the expert and say this is what I want, these are my preferences, can you implement that? And it's very easy to quickly negotiate and get into the result rather than discussing the requirement for a month or two and then get some surprises. Will AI be a job displacer or a job creator? Uh, I'll say that Dr with the AI knowledge will be more successful than doctor without AI knowledge. That means the professional, every professional has to be smart, no AI, then you'll be more successful. And which AI tool are you most impressed with? Uh, on professional side, I use OpenAI, uh, but I do the creativity as well. Uh, so Runway, ML and there are multiple Adobe, uh, Firefly and other software where now I'm able to give a text saying I need an actor watching uh, towards the sun and the camera is uh, moving from back and take the drone shot and it generates the image right on the videos and that's what I'm using on the creative side to generate all of uh, videos for my songs. Yeah, I, you know, he's been like working on creating, I, I heard that a couple of days back, some 15, 16 years back that he wrote some songs and uh, now they are live because of the AI. Yeah, so the, this is English song. I have uh, uh, delivered almost six Hindi song and one English song just to do the marketing and see how it is going to be a global audience. So the song is such a god you are. If you get chances, you can search on YouTube. And the whole video and the storyline is generated through, uh, like I said, Adobe and Runway ML, and you'll feel like this is a real human uh, acting. And the right person for you was the previous panelist, I think, from Saregama there. Right. Okay, Shuchi, in one word. How would you describe generative AI? Creating content, content, generative AI. Great. And what excites you most about generative AI? It is able to give power to create even to the non-technical uh, individuals. So, uh, for example, in my uh, journey of entrepreneurship, I wanted a digital expert who can create graphics and uh, uh, create content for me. But I think uh, generative AI has made this possible, has given me the power to do it on my own instead of hiring another agency, cutting costs. Okay. What are the core business skills that every AI leader needs today? First one, problem solving. 
definitely uh, storytelling and uh, from technical point of view uh, coding skills are important but then whoever is doing the coding needs to have the purpose of solving the business problem in perspective and one example of this common problem that you hear while solving for non technical stakeholders uh, sorry, uh, just to be one example yeah. of a common problem you hear while solving for non-technical stakeholders. Uh, so common. So one problem I just mentioned, uh, the graphic designing, the, the native AI is solving is, it's uh, giving the power to the non-technical uh, individuals, the power to create the content on their own, especially the founders and startup ecosystem. It's quite beneficial. Sure. Thank you. Professor Sirak, in your terms, one word for generative AI? Unintelligent. <laughs> Simply. Okay. What excites you most about generative AI then? How people rush to it without validation. Just uh, give you one, few, well, one example that was widespread in the news uh, a few days ago about Air Canada um, using a chatbot, but I think that was built on top like OpenAI, ChatGPT where basically like have been giving people false information about refunding and all of that which made a huge mess to the company. So I think people really rushed to it but they need to slow down a little bit. Okay, that's you you know you're getting this from an academician. So how do you think AI will transform edtech? I think it's not only edtech but what I've seen AI has already started to transform lots of um, lots of areas for education in general uh, or specific I, I think there is Lots of repetitive processes that it could help with the gradings, for example, but also could create opportunities for um, personalized also education as well and helping some people that might need a special way of, of education. But again, this is something that you can definitely have analogy in, in healthcare where you started a few years ago as well, having algorithm to uh, reduce the workloads, right? And again, to the point of the other uh, panelists here that probably people in any domain that will have the knowledge of using help, uh, AI will be replacing people in the same domain that don't know how to use AI. And what is one implication of AI that no one is talking about? Ethics. Ethics. Um, we, have, we, have, we have heard a lot of things, we've seen a lot of uh, great models like the ChatGPT. Uh, we don't know the source of the data, right? And even when people create things like images or videos, they said, oh, we created a person that never exists. No, it's a combination of lots of features from other images they have used. We don't know what is the source. Personal images, videos, movies, they definitely have used that. They don't speak about that. We still trying to figure a way to get a hold of that, but it's, it's definitely ethics is the main, the main issue we have now. Right. Give to you one word to ready bear. Immature. Nice adjectives, right? And what excites you most about the ready bear? A very tactical thing for me, local news. It has a terrible business model. It's incredibly important to all of us. And if we can use generative AI with the right data sources to create a local news uh, ecosystem and report on things happening in, in our cities, in our neighborhoods, I think there's a huge opportunity. And according to you, one industry where AI has made significant contributions? I think some of the early signs in healthcare are, are really cool to see how using AI tools you can identify symptoms and the, the kind of impact of those symptoms and the source of those symptoms faster than a, a doctor could traditionally do. So while everybody talks about content, you being in the content doesn't relate to say that AI is contributing to content. Great. And what do you see the next big thing after OpenAI chat TV? More kind of business driven tools. So one of the really cool things we're doing right now is uh, using Copilot, which is an AI tool that checks code before you push it to a repo. That makes our developers better. It takes cognitive load off of them. It improves the output of what they're doing. Those types of tools are gonna pop up more and more and improve the outcomes and the output from humans. And that I think is where, where the future is for me. 
the queue and over to you to steal one word or get rid of the other. Just another data driven system. Okay. <laughs> and what excites you most about get rid of it? It's a new dish on the menu of my data kitchen. Okay. And what is that first AI tool that you used? I used Eliza from Ratzenbaum because I was looking for a friend that really understands <coughs> myself. Okay. The last question, one final advice you would share with the audience on managing stakeholders. So there is no magic, there is no free lunch. Treat your data as you treat your food and handle it with care. And final, 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 respect the people. Thank you. That's it. We've artificially, intelligently managed to do that within the time. Thank you for that. Can I just share one message for clients, uh, industries we are belonging to, non-technical side? So this message is like, even if you are not ready for AI as of now, still start the journey with the assessments and figure out the areas through uh, by meeting and talking to experts of AI and figure out those areas where you need to uh, work because this journey is is long and it needs support and comments from people who are experts. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions from the audience for any of us, please? So it's not what we want, um, but actually much more complexities of what we, the way we think and everything is kind of um, to where where do you think this journey? I mean, any comments on, on what's coming here? Sure. So one thing I can add on that. So AI was a buzzword. I'm saying was because now there's a new word buzzword. It's called AGI, right? So it's a general intelligence where what I think the next level is going to be like human, uh, we can perform multiple activities. As of now, we have chat GPT, which can only do chat. Somebody where we can generate image, some, somewhere we can generate video. So it looks like AGI is going to be next thing, and like software I mentioned, they're already using this terminology and saying AI is behind now, we are AGI. I just extend to that, uh, I think a few years back itself, we started talking, and maybe a decade back itself, we started talking about predictive right, from prescriptive and descriptive, right? And uh, AI is at that plus. Today, it is only solving for what we know today and what we ask. Tomorrow, and it's not that far, I think in bits and pieces, it is already happening. It, 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 it is happening maybe in an intelligent system of a car, right? Where it is going to come and tell you first, even before you blink, that this is going to be the problem and I am going to solve for you, right? So it is not that far. Uh, I, there are few systems uh, that I'm aware they are already doing it, but they are at a very nascent stage. The only thing is that people are yet understanding how AI can actually be applied to each other. So for example, if I come and tell you that, well, this is, uh, you know, I'm going to solve for you. Because I, I have my own business problems. You know, my management, my board, or me, them say, I, you know, my business model has given me a different you know, a challenge. How do I solve for that first? So today we are biased towards what we want to solve. When we reach that stage, we have to be very, very flexible because then we have to adapt to that change of someone coming and telling us, no, I'm more intelligent than you. On the ethical part, I, I think it's gonna happen. It's just, that's why everyone's now rushing to to have an achievement or go as far as they can you have seen different the eu act and all of this right so there are going to be laws in place but before that i think that's why everyone is rushing to it so just need to be patient i believe there will be technologies to 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 capture that i don't think it will be done retrospectively though unfortunately but 
I think it's like any other technology. You just need to give it some time. Particularly on the importance of data. However, I think it really becomes a problem for startups, especially, to update their initial set of data, right? So, for example, ad tech, if we wanted to do something like personalization, I expect we need data for a particular user behavior. And I think this really turns the whole thing to a chicken and egg problem. If I want to get my product up, I need user data. But if I don't get my product up, I don't get users. So, uh, my question is how do startups even get their first bunch of data in order to train AI? and to choose a specific AI that they want to use for their particular problem. Yeah, maybe one. The, the only thing that I've seen that worked out quite well is you need a partner, collaboration. So the existing companies are not fast enough or don't have the capabilities to implement, but they have the data, you have the skill set. So I think it's collaboration. I think you're also going to start seeing more and more data licensing agreements, right, where uh, as a startup, you know there's other companies that have done a similar thing, but you have an innovation on top of it, and you can license some of that data through a provider. Some of that is happening now, but I think it's it, the data sets aren't clean enough, they're not understandable enough to easily license, and, and there isn't kind of a marketplace for it in the right way, but I, I think you're gonna see more and more of that. I just want to add on that. I have been in the last two, three years advising and mentoring some of the new startups on their go-to-market. Uh, and you're right when you say that they don't have data, but they do have a unique selling idea, which they have to sell. They need to focus on that. That's their North Star. So even before they think about how data, because that data will build over a time period, right? But there has to be some unique selling or USP for that company, right? If you are not able to relate, and many of the panelists here, even in the previous discussion, they mentioned about relating, communicating, managing those expectations. If I, as a startup, is not able to understand the need of the customer or my target segment, then data is not going to help, right? That comes secondary, right? Just one, one final point, I think there need to be also some regulations around data ownership. I've been in this for so long. If, if you take my data, either about how's my education, my healthcare data, I still need to have this ownership, right? Now companies or if you use a device to measure a signal from your body, they take the ownership of that data. Because probably this is how we do now, but probably this needs to change as well. Great, any other questions? Thank you. Changes really possible to be back with the introduction of AI. What what are the areas uh, or the departments in the data science that you see would be utilizing AI in the future? And is there any steps that the banking industry, uh, not specifically just the UAE or specifically or the global banking industry, have they initiated any AI related pro AI related projects? And at what stage are they? So, uh, and if, uh, this is the same discussion that you know, we were having in the morning, right? Uh, while the AI buzzword has come today, uh, and we say that AI is being used and it can do the best of AML tracking, from, you know, transaction monitoring, or fraud management, I can tell you that we are already using some systems which were in place for the last three, four, five years without the name of the AI doing fraud monitoring, right? They are available in this market, they are available globally, those are global companies, right? So that is one area. The second, where I think it is at a nascent stage, is the customer experience. What we moved from a customer experience of a traditional bank was a app or a UI based of an experience. If you were to open some new account, buy a product from a bank, or maybe voice chat with some of that. So we've seen most of our banks that we bank with are already offering those, you know, like, the next is the AI. What if the AI can guide you how your financial planning is? Now somebody from the audience might say, oh, well, that is happening because my bank is doing. But what they're doing is only the products that they have. Nobody's counseling you today, like a portfolio counselor, 
but only guiding you to sell what I want to sell you, right? So AI, whether it is financial planning, whether it is your social protection, whether it is to do with, you know, the right level of products that you need and how you can even manage taxes and all. All of this tomorrow is going to come with your banks, right? Another interesting, today marketing campaigns are data driven, right? And if you were to talk about the effectiveness of that, the effectiveness lies between 5 to 30 percent. There is no perfect anybody talking about 40, 50 percent or 100 percent conversion rate. That's it. AI will only provide a bit more precision to it, which means instead of just doing, let's say, a few targeted campaigns and doing personalization, what I feel, AI can churn that around much faster and give you a personalized approach, loyalty programs, rewards, much sooner in your app and wherever you go, maybe it can just send you an SMS, oh, here, you are an intercontinental, let me provide you with an offer without me as a bank knowing. So those are some of the things it has started. Uh, we are working on it, and many other banks are working on it, but I think uh, it's just the tip right now. There is a huge and significant growth that is going to come on that side. Okay, as one disclaimer, for very good reason, there's a lot of regulation, especially in the banking sector, and the maturity of the tools that are currently labeled as AI is at a level that currently nobody would use it because then you are not compliant to laws and this is especially about ethics, data protection and um, avoiding certain stuff. But of course, the, the opportunities are great. Exactly. That's it. Anyone else? Thank you. Thanks everyone.